Welcome back, friends, to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. It's your friend Lisa Mason Ziegler here, and um, glad you decided to join me because this is a good one, y'all. I um, I did grow lilies. I have grown lilies in my career. I only grew LA hybrids, and I knew to really provide a snapshot to you of what is kind of the potential of growing lilies, of how they can be a part of your business, a big part of your business, a small part of your business, and just some of the different options that Val was my go-to person. She has really built her business, as she'll tell you, she built her business on big bulbs and what big bulbs do for you, what they grow, the, the show they put on, and she sold them as cut flowers, she has sold them as potted flowers, And I just so appreciated her sharing her experiences um, with growing lilies. And so what we wanted to kind of do in this um, podcast episode is to kind of paint the picture of what the bottom line is of how, you know, it's that that key piece that I think is so often missed. People don't understand that lilies are programmed. That's how you can provide them for all season or even year round if you have the place to grow them. Um, just kind of showing us all of the opportunities. And so let's take a listen to my good friend Val Shermer of Three Toed Farms, which is located in Winchester, Kentucky. Val is also the current ASCFG president. She's, of course, one of our instructors um, for an on-demand course that we offer. And um, let's take a listen to Val Sharon, just what she did with lilies for all these years. Hey, Val. I'm just so glad to have you back here on the Field and Garden podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so tickled to be here. And I mean, the subject we're talking about today is going to be a super eye opener. I can still remember when I learned more about lilies. Um, and I, I know I kind of I know that you all aren't currently growing lilies now, but you have grown lilies for many years. And when I hear oriental lilies, I just see Val's face right over there, <laughs> right there on top of that. Um, so we are talking today about how commercial growers can grow lilies. And we're just going to kind of give you a little peekaboo into the world of lilies and hopefully give you some um, some tips. And so first, Val, I want to hear, so what made you know about lilies or make you want to grow lilies? Well, it was in the 90s, I think, that I went to a place called White Flower Farm in Connecticut a very high-end nursery. I went for a workshop. It's a destination place to go on lots of people's bucket lists. But there I saw oriental lilies growing in their white garden, which were spectacular. But then I went further back on the property, discovered their test garden. And that's where I fell in love with lilies because they were back there, all colors. They were so fragrant. I came home thinking, I want to do this. Awesome. And so now we'll just warp forward to us being commercial growers. And um, we know that there is a demand for quality, gorgeous lilies. I mean, of course, I say this because I believe it's true. There's no comparison to the quality and the vase life to a locally grown lily compared to a shipped in lily. Would you agree with that? I totally agree. Um, and that's what we found to be the case. Our, our business has been built on big bulbs. The bigger the bulb, the bigger the show. Um, and we are all about a big show about flowers that can stop, stop people in their tracks. There's also a market for people that want to grow smaller lilies if they want to include them in their arrangements. And we can talk about that too, which would not be a great big bulb. Uh, But by growing the great big bulbs, we were able to get $7 to $9 a stem at the farmer's market. Sell out every week. Yeah, they kind of just sweep you off your feet when they're like that. And I'm glad that you brought up... um, 
So when I grew lilies, I did not, I grew LA hybrids. That's the only ones I ever grew for whatever reason. I guess Dave guided me to those. And we only grew them for our local florist business. And I mean, they bought, every, it didn't matter how many I planted. We, they, it was, a, we had stand in orders every week. And so they were as taken as the retail end user. So I know that there is amazing opportunities. And then I also, I mean, for me, which I never explored this, um, but I know our friends, um, Steve and Gretel Adams, I think do it. There's a lot of growers that grow, like you just mentioned, smaller bulbs, probably Asiatics to include in their mixed bouquets, whether they're doing farmer's markets or supermarket bouquets, because they're such great long lasting flowers, right? Oh yeah, they last. I mean, the vase life is incredible. In fact, whenever we had somebody, usually a woman who would balk at the price at the farmer's market, that she, I would give her a stem, never reduce the price. I would give her a stem of marketing. Yeah. Great marketing. And, and as, and she would, they would go home and they would snap off each bloom because they didn't have to have one stem and they would put it in vases all around their house and they were hooked. Yep. You know, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar, right? You, you sure don't do. need to justify. I tell, try to explain to people. It's like, you're starting a conversation sometimes with people that are questioning a price is a very common one. Yep. It is, I mean, you have to prove it to them. And the best way to do it is say, here, take some home and try it. You right. know, I right. mean, and it's just so simple and that is money well spent. And that is the least amount of what you've got. And so, all right. So you were growing them um, and going to farmer's markets. And so I want to just enter right here into, um, don't lilies just bloom in the middle of summer? How is it, is it, how is it possible to grow lilies year round? I know you did. I couldn't because I don't have hoop houses. I did them, you know, outdoors in my garden, even though I grew them in crates. But um, let's talk about that secret or that, that fact that escapes a lot of people is that we grew what were called programmed lily bulbs, right? Yes. And so we grew lilies year round in our uh, two greenhouses we did grow outside at first, and then we realized, wait, they all bloom at once. So we needed to expand it. We started off, we, we tried to see if we could actually force them so that we would have them before or after when they were growing outside, which we could. And so that's what set us on our journey then to get, uh, we got lilies in every week by the crate and they would come in frozen. And we would, uh, we pot those up. Originally, we potted every single one in a gallon pot uh, because that's how we started out doing it. And then we evolved to where we would grow them in a crate, uh, which was easier to handle, but we still grew them in gallon pots because we also sold the plant to people. And we also Art. sold bulbs. And so, you know, we could, and the more people that bought our lily bulbs and grew them themselves, they became our biggest cut, cut flower customers. You know, that's so true. And so you say they were frozen when you got them. So right. what, you know, I didn't understand and didn't know that suppliers have store these lilies at a certain temperature. So when they take them out to ship them to us, that lily bulb or that bulb is waking up and saying, "Ooh, it's almost time to start growing here soon. And that's why you have to have them shipped. Um, I actually had them shipped every other week and I would put them into a cooler a cold cooler as soon as I got them for the half that I didn't plant that week. Because just like, you know, the whole sunflower succession party, if you plant lilies every week, as long as their bloom time is connected, right? Because some lilies take 10 weeks, some lilies take 18 weeks. It can be, it's right. all, it's all about the numbers y'all. Um, anyway, so the, the, the suppliers take them out of the freezer, ship them to us. And the pretense is, is that we'll pot them up either in the, whatever way you're doing it. And then they start growing. And that's how you have lilies year round versus when you buy lilies and plant them out in your garden, the natural blooming time is when actually, is it June or July? We're in, uh, you know, we're in Kentucky. And so ours start in May and they would go through August, depending on the varieties that we were planting. 
Right. And so it's just, you can't really control it. Right. No. All right. No. So we, for all of the rest of this conversation, we're talking about planting what we're going to call programmed bulbs, meaning they were kept frozen until right before they were shipping um, to us. So tell us a little bit about your experience um, growing in pots and crates. So you've already said pots, you sold the pot and the plant and the crates is that's where you got your cut flowers from. Is that what I'm guessing? Right. We would, um, we actually would cut flowers off of either one because when we were potting up our bulbs in a crate, we'd always have a couple extra. And so those would end up in pots as well. But um, we also, when we got those crates in, they go right into the cooler because you don't want them thawing completely out. Lily bulbs will start to deteriorate if they're out of the ground. And so people, you can't hold them for four weeks before you plant them. You can't yeah. put them in your garage and then plant them. You also aren't going to be successful in holding them over from year to year so that you can program them yourself because let's leave that to the experts. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we got them in, like I said, every week, sometimes we would go every other week, but most of it was every week. And we planted them in crates. Uh, we, um, that was the most efficient for us. We use a bark, a really coarse bark based, um, um, uh, potting soil because we wanted it to drain really well. Bulbs yeah. will rot if they are in standing water. So that, yeah. uh, and then we, we planted them. Lilies also grow most of their roots above the bulb. They have a little bit of roots that come underneath the bulb, but mostly the roots come off of the stem. And so we would take a crate, we put paper, newspaper in it, then we would add some dirt, a little bit of dirt. Uh, an inch there. or two or? Yes, an inch or two. And then we would put in the lilies and then we would add about six inches over them. Water it well, and then we would put it, um, put it on, the, uh, on the tables in the greenhouse. We, uh, we grew great big bulbs. So we would grow primarily the 18 to 20 centimeter size bulbs. So those are big ones. Those are and whoppers. They whoppers. Have, they're whoppers. They can produce a whopper flower, <laughs> but that's a large one. And for those, we did 12 per crate. Because so you need we're to talking give about room. orientals. Is that kind yes. of what your strong, what your area of specialty was for your market as you all pursued orientals pretty much exclusively, or did you also grow other stuff? We also uh, grew the uh, OTs, the Orient Pets. Lily says, are you asking me about other lilies or about other Yeah, yeah, grow? I guess let's just add that in right now. So um, you primarily started and that was your biggest crop maybe was the Orientals. And then you added in some others to kind of add into the mix. Is that right? Other lilies, you mean? Yeah, yeah. other types yeah. of lilies. Yeah, we actually started out with uh, LA Hybrids because those are the ones that's a cross between Asiatic and the L part is longer form. So that's Easter lilies. They are great garden performers. So mm -hmm. they do great in the ground as well. They're very vigorous. They're the most vigorous, I think of the lilies. They also had the least amount of fragrance. And so we were all about fragrance. So we did some LA hybrids, very few. We grew some trumpets, which are the big towering, very, very fragrant. And then we grew the OTs, which is a cross between a trumpet and an oriental lily. And those are fragrant and big flowers. Uh, since we also sold plants and bulbs, we want to have great garden performers too. Right. So, um, and we grew lots and lots of orientals. And, you know, there's nothing like an oriental lily, right? And I would just think that, yeah, big bulbs equal big flowers. Yep. And so for those varieties that you just mentioned, is it kind of the same rule that you follow? The bigger bulbs produce the best flower for the mark? I mean, y'all kind of became known to be those big flower people, right? We did. We did. We When we started out, we had the harebrained notion that we wanted to try to grow the kinds of flowers that could stop people in their tracks. And that became kind of our, our mission for everything that we did. So yes, we get uh, big bulbs of all of the lilies uh, that we grow. In fact, any bulb we, go, we grow, we get big ones. 
And that's just going to make a bigger display, which was sort of our claim to fame. Um, They, uh, so we were growing them in the greenhouse then, you know, year round. And we would, once we cut the lilies then, and they were long stems, um, they went straight into the cooler and we could, we held them there, but um, we would save the bulbs if they were blooming, you know, when they would normally be blooming outside. So they would be on, like if you, if you got a lily that would normally be blooming in July and we have them in the crates and we cut them in July, uh, we would save that crate of lilies. We would put it outside for the rest of the summer. We would water it. We would fertilize it just like if it was in your yard. And then in the fall, we would pull out the biggest of those bulbs and we would sell them in September at the farmer's market. So you sold the stem and then you sold the bulb. You know, I was, it's on my list to ask you that because part of what we did um, with those LA hybrids, which you did mention, they are the best garden performers. Um, I still, I have not, we quit the Lily program. I bet it's been 12 years ago. Um, And only because nothing wrong with the lilies, just because of as, as business evolved, I still have lilies in my garden that bloom every single year, big and beautiful that are from back then. And so what we did for our LA hybrids, which we also planted in crates, um, we didn't actually water them and we immediately, we needed the crates. So as the crates were being unplanted, you know, soon after we harvested them, we just pulled the bulbs and put them in fishnet bags and we sold them at the farmer's market, I think for like $15 a bag for 20 bulbs. And that was a deal. Plus they were big bulbs. And I still get pictures from people show, showing me their lily garden that they got from that. So um, so LA hybrids would take a little bit more abuse, I think. That would explain it. I didn't realize that they were the hardiest, perhaps, of all the lilies um, in a garden environment. But that would really explain that. So that is so awesome. So yeah, I would get 60 or 80 cents for the bulb at the end, plus selling the stem, because the lily process, I will just mention now, I mean, we used like whatever soil mix we were buying back then. You've got to have the crates, the soil, and the labor to plant them and unplant them, right? And not to mention caring for them. So I want to ask you, um, so did you all grow all of your crates indoors in houses? Yes. Yep, we did it all in in the, we had two 30 by 60 stuffy greenhouses with evaporative coolers on them. We put shade cloth over it in the summertime because lilies don't want to really be blooming when it's, you know, if it's going to be a hundred degrees. Right. They like right. to be a little bit, they like to be a little bit cooler. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we grew them. And then we hand watered them. Actually, each of the crates, we don't overhead water. We didn't run drip tape over them. We hand watered them because that kept us connected with them, involved with them. Uh, We uh, had a little card at the end of in each crate that we we um, had in there. It was stuck into a um, plastic fork, tines up, and that's what held the held the card. Every time we watered, we wrote it down. Every time we fertilized, we wrote it down. We wrote down when they started blooming um, because they bloom a lot quicker in the summertime than they would like in right. December because we also right. grew them then. And we fertilized them every two two weeks after they were about three to four inches tall with just 20, 20, 20 water soluble fertilizer. And so I was going to ask you about feeding and watering because, you know, I hand watered also. I think hmm. that that's the general. I have seen people run tape. But I totally agree with you because let me just say, if you miss the harvest window on lilies, you're pretty much done. You have wasted your money unless you have a low, like for me back then, I didn't have a real local market for them where you could just put them in the middle of a bouquet. Um, So having that, doing that one-on-one watering, I believe, and I think, I'm not sure if it was Frank Arnowski or... um, Steve or Gretel or somebody that said that watering the seedlings 
was, I think it was Mike Hutchinson actually, that may have said this, that water the, watering the seedlings and I would put watering the lilies are the job for the boss because it keeps you so darn connected to what's happening. You know, when is it time? What's something wrong with that tray of seedlings? You don't want to hear about it the day they go to be planted and you don't have enough. And the same thing is true with lilies, right? I mean, it's like you want to see, oh my, those buds are starting to color up. We got to cut those tomorrow, <laughs> right? I mean, so those are really good tips. Um, and so I just sideline, you know, rabbit hole, um, <laughs> you know, people know that I don't have, I think, any hoop or greenhouses. I can't, I'm in the middle of the city. And so I was actually brave enough to grow lilies outdoors in crates. I actually had seven um, picnic tables that came from a park that Steve brought home. We never knew what we were going to do with those picnic tables until I started growing lilies. And that allowed me just to get them up off the ground, which made it easier for harvesting and watering. Um, and I will tell you what else growing in crates outdoors really came when we were, um, could not Katrina, when, um, Isabel, which was the hurricane that wreaked so much havoc here. We were without power for 17 days and two houses on my street were condemned from big trees falling on them. Guess who spent two days tractoring inside this building, all the lilies that were outside. That was in 2002, bringing them all indoors. So there's really even more advantages to growing in containers, you know, you can move them. Um, but I was crazy enough to grow them outdoors. I had to do tear, deer prevention, um, which you may not have to do obviously in a greenhouse, I guess, um, but it's possible, but it's laborious, which is the reason we really stopped growing them. We made a lot of money. They were in demand. They were awesome, but there was easier ways I found to make that same amount of profit in other ways. So I agree. I can see that because it is, um, right. Chipmunks will eat bulbs. Yes. Squirrels. So, yep. They, they love them. Um, if people grow them themselves, all you got to worry about is don't plant them where it's going to be waterlogged. And if you get chickens or, I mean, chickens, if you get chipmunks or squirrels or deer, they're going to, they're going to be eating them. Um, one of the yes. things I wanted to mention, because we sell, you know, we we're, we're high end and we didn't sell to florists because we didn't wholesale because we didn't have to. Right. Um, is that as soon as you can get your fingers into each one of those buds to pull off the anthers, which is where the pollen is inside there, um, that will keep the blooms clean. Because if you wait till they open up and then that pollen gets dry, it's like cinnamon it will stain everything. Yeah. And I think that Orientals have gotten a bad rap through the years for that. You know what yep. I mean? And um, so that's really good. So Val, can you kind of tell us, like maybe share some of your favorite Orientals and the whatever you, whatever you tell us about, I will list in the show notes below. And we do know that sometimes Lilies come and lilies go. So people might not be able to find every single one of them, but there's usually a comparable one. So why don't you tell us about some of your favorite go-to lilies and what family they're in? Sure. Um, and these are going to be ones that primarily are big and bold, and they're primarily going to have up-facing blooms. Because uh, something like a Casablanca, fabulous, but it tends to look down. Great in the garden not so great as a cut flower in our opinion. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention if anybody has a customer that doesn't like the fragrance, there's a lot of people that don't like lily fragrance or they're allergic to it. They should go for the LA hybrids. They're not as fragrant, very soft or the rose lilies also. And we'll talk about that. Um, so under the LA hybrid, there was one I wanted to mention that is so cute and it's called eyeliner <laughs> and it's like a Piketty. So it's a creamy color petal with just a dark purple around the outside. It's cute as could be, um, on the whites, because we always grow whites. People love white lilies. There were three of them that really, we, we constantly, uh, use depending on if we could get the big bulbs for them. One of them is called Zambezi and it's an oriental trumpet. So it would uh, 
typically bloom a little earlier if it was in the out in your yard. The other two orientals that we grew are Ariosto and Rialto. Fabulous, fabulous white lilies. Uh, one of our all-time favorites is called Conca Dior. And, and lots of people are going to be familiar with that. It's an oriental trumpet. It is like lemon meringue pie. Oh, yummy. It is gorgeous. And the petals have a lot of, I always just tell people, a lot of substance to them. They're not flimsy. They are thick, huge, huge bloom. Um, there's some pinks. And the good thing about growing pinks is that if um, that kind of hides that pollen dust, Oh yeah. Yeah. And so if people aren't so good about pulling off those anthers, they can, you know, a pink is a good um, thing to grow. One of the all time favorites is Sorbonne, which is, I think also one of Dave Dowling's all time favorites. I remember that name. Yeah. And then we also grow a light uh, one called Lake Cary. And that one had a deeper color stripe down the middle of it. It was an Oriental. And then Merlon is one of our very favorites. Uh, it's a magenta and pink oriental with edged in white. So it was really pretty too. A couple of really flashy ones. One of them is called Flashpoint and it's an oriental trumpet and it's up facing and it's an explosion of color. It is creamy yellow uh, petals with a really wide band of raspberry on each petal. It is gorgeous in, in your yard or in a, an arrangement. It is gorgeous. Um, there's one called Eudoxia, which that'll be on the list. Um, kind of hard to pronounce, but it's an oriental trumpet, soft glowing salmon color. Mm. Um, on the rose lilies, and the first time we ever sold a rose lily, um, well, our first pollen free lily was like in 2003. So that's when they first kind of started. The rose lilies are double lilies. Ooh. They're pollenless. Ooh. So the good thing about that is they will last longer as a cut flower because they don't have the pollen. Right. They aren't as strong on fragrance at all. And they just don't make a mess. And those double blooms. Um, they are a little bit shorter in our experience. Um, but um, we searched for a white one far and wide because most of them are pink. And Isabella is a great pink Double Beauty is a beautiful pink. Um, we grew one called uh, Carolina. That was our first uh, pure white or white lily, white double lily. And then also there is one called Annika that was white with chartreuse. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, oh my mm, goodness. Mm, mm. People <laughs> will buy those bulbs. And we sold the bulbs, uh, three of them to a bag. This was in the spring. So we're selling the ones that we were getting in. At this at a high end antique and garden show, we sold them for fifteen dollars and sold out. So we're getting five dollars a bulb, uh, which is yeah. a pretty good price. Uh, and then I have now started growing lilies again at Three Toads Farm, not to sell as cut flowers, but just to bring them back to our farm. And two of my favorites from the last two years, one of them is called Black Beauty, and it is a huge fragrant oriental that almost looks like a giant martagon, but it's a raspberry deep color. And then one I grew last year is called Tiger Babies. And it looks like a martagon lily. It is freckled and it's peach colored and it's one of the happiest things in the world. You know, Val, um, you know, anybody listening to this thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to sell bulbs. You know, that's quite a you know, a good profit margin perhaps. But first off, I, there's just a few things you know, I'm the numbers girl, always. You have to order in a timely manner. You have to buy the right bulbs. You have to package them. You have to keep them from sprouting. There is so much more involved. So there's a lot more involved than what people think. But here's what we're offering. We are often offering to the retail customer, the person that's taking it home and planting it, something they're never going to find anywhere else. So it's really, I mean, I see this as being, 
you know, some growers do a lot of plant starts in the spring, you know, whether it's vegetables or flowers, and that's a great way to get an infusion of cash early. And you can do that with lily bulbs, but with lily bulbs, there is a huge investment. You got to pay for those bulbs long before you sell them most likely. So I think that that is just a great opportunity, but y'all, I always, when I get, when I think of this, I always think of Pamela and Frank and their book, We're Going to Get Rich, because Frank would be thinking right now, we're selling three packs of lily bulbs for the rest of our life, right? And we're going to get rich. Well, it's just not that simple, friends. <laughs> it is just not that simple. Um, so, all right, Val. So we're going to put in the show notes, all those crazy names she just said for you guys. What are some places, like first off, as a home gardener, what would be the go-to place to find some really great varieties? And some of those you just mentioned, perhaps. Um, I'll start off with the home gardener. And one thing to keep in mind, like we said, lily bulbs start to deteriorate when they're out of the ground. So you don't want people buying them from uh, big box stores where they're cheap because they have been sitting on that rack and they will just dry out. It's not like a daffodil. They will start to deteriorate when they're out of the ground. So people that I think do an excellent job with getting them done right and to the to you on time is uh, White Flower Farm up in Connecticut is spectacular. There's also Brent and Becky's Bulbs. One of my neighbors. They are fabulous. Um, I love them. And then there's um, uh, John Sheepers up mm. in Connecticut. Yeah. And there's probably some other ones too, but those are the ones that I would recommend or check out your local garden center and yeah. go there and support the local garden, not the big box stores, but your local garden center might even have lilies that are already growing in pots. Yeah. Give you a head start. And then for the commercial grower, um, we started out with Fred Glockner. That's who helped us. Ron Beck, who is their head master bulb guy. Um, and uh, then we went with Co Claver, Zabo Plants for years. Co is excellent. He was always excellent for us. I strongly recommend him. And then you can also go to Ball through right. ColorLink. Um, those are the ones that I would say top of mind. And so we're going to include them in all the show notes. And, you know, Val, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us because, you know, I didn't know about a couple of things that you mentioned, and it's just really, really um, good to know. And um, so y'all, I don't know if y'all are aware of this or not, but Val is also one of our instructors. Um, she has is does one of our on-demand courses, um, forcing, I've already, I have to always look at your name because I know what I want to say, and it's a little bit different than that, sorry, forcing glorious blooms for the holidays and beyond, and in that on-demand course, which um, is over a couple hours long, Val is sharing this kind of information on amaryllis and making high-end containers and recommend you guys check it out. It's always available at thegardenersworkshop.com. And Val, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Lisa, it is a delight talking with you. Thank you so much. Till we meet again, friends. Ciao. All right, folks. I mean, if she didn't whet your appetite to grow and sell lilies, um, you know, I just don't even know what would. And so I am going to list in the show notes those favorite varieties that she listed, as well as the home gardener and the grower, some of the sources that she is sharing. Um, for anybody that wants to do a deep dive in growing bulbs like lilies, you know, there's a whole bunch of others. Um, you know, Dave Dowling is our go-to expert on that. And his course, um, Bulbs, Perennials, Woodies, and more um, is a school course because it is so long. You can check that out at thegardenersworkshop.com, and I'll put a link to that um, 
And I just am so grateful to li- um, to Val for sharing that with us. And I also want to, um, you know, while we're in this connection, um, you know, we learn more from others in our trade. I really want to um, remind everybody that I'm just really pleased that I am that the Field and Garden podcast is actually now partnering with Growing for Market magazine. You know, I have said more than once, and I tell my students that I attribute the lion's share of my success to this publication. There are articles um, that include growing on growing and business um, that literally seeded my way to success. So the Growing for Market magazine has published practical ideas and information for direct flower um, growers and vegetable growers, and they've been doing that for over 31 years. All of the articles are written by people, farmers, who are out there doing the job themselves and they know what they're doing. They have first, I like to call it practical firsthand experience. Um, This magazine is, um, still has the same mission as when the book that most of us read to get started in flower farming, the Flower Farmer book by Lynn Bozinski, um, who founded the magazine in 1992. They are still following the same path of connecting growers with the best ideas from other growers. Y'all, the networking, it's like the network of the farmer world kind of really mesh and get together. Um, There is dedicated flower content in every magazine, a decade's worth of back issues, and over 1,600 archived articles from writers like Aaron of Florette, Gretel and Steve of Sunny Meadows, Pamela and Frank Arnowski, our rock star growers, um, and then Jonathan and Megan Lease have written, and they're all available in the archives. You can go back and read those. With 10 new issues every year, and they're available on paper, digitally, or you can get both, you're guaranteed to find something um, to fine-tune your operation in Growing for Market. So if you're a doing a farmer's market, a CSA, a farm stand, a pick your own, florist sales, or wholesaling, whether you're a commercial grower or you just want to grow like one, subscribing to Growing for Market is the nitty, has the nitty gritty details of growing, marketing, and the business of local farming. And we have a special offer for you. You can use the coupon code WORKSHOP to get 25% off of any subscription to the original Farmer to Farmer magazine at growingformarket.com. Friends, I want to also just add into that, that the business discussions that go on in that magazine, whether they're vegetable growers or flower growers, was so key and helpful for me. So we really highly recommend that. And there is a special opportunity that you can actually take advantage of to get 25% off. All right, friends, until we meet again, ciao.